Are you a man looking for an intensive program to help you overcome your sexually addictive behaviors? Gateway to Freedom is your answer. Gateway to Freedom is a three-day intensive workshop for men seeking to overcome sexually addictive behaviors. Whether married, single, or divorced, Gateway to Freedom will help men regain hope for a new life of purity and real contentment. The workshop is conducted by experts in the field of sexual addiction recovery. Your experts have over 35 years of combined experience. Read testimonials of workshop alumni at gatewaymen.com. Get all the info and register online at gatewaymen.com or call 1-800-49-PURITY. Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I'm the founder of the Gateway to Freedom Workshop. I want to personally invite you to be part of our next workshop coming up October 23rd through the 25th in Texas. So call us today at 1-800-49-PURITY or visit gatewaymen.com. Welcome to Pure Sex Radio, training men, educating women. Are you ready to get real and start living each day in purity? This dynamic program is designed to educate, encourage, and equip listeners with the tools necessary for living a life of sexual purity. Pure Sex Radio brings you the best in mobile talk radio. Listen to real life struggles, learn how to overcome lust, pornography, and sex addiction, and get serious about purity. Good day, radio listeners. Welcome to this week's edition of the Pure Sex Radio Broadcast. Glad to have you here with us. I'm going to continue sharing a series that I gave on a talk called A Life of Radical Integrity. This is a four-part series. Can't give you every single minute of every single talk, but want to at least give you a flavor of what does it take to live a life of radical integrity as a man in our culture today. And so this second part of the series is entitled A Radical Integrity vision. And so I hope you enjoy this broadcast. And if you've got questions for us, or if you just want to get contacted with us to get more help on your journey, please do so. We'll give you that information at the end of the broadcast. Enjoy. You're listening to Pure Sex Radio, training men, educating women. Visit us on the web at puresexradio.com. That is the wrong vision to have when it comes to dealing with this issue of of sexual lust. But sadly, though, this is the vision that most men have when they think about their struggle with porn or any other kind of sexual sin or temptation. Stop it! Right? Here's the thing, though. Whatever we are focused on, whether positively or negatively, we are moving in the direction of what we focus on. So we always are going to be moving in the direction of our focus. So think about it this way. I call it the principle of pink elephants. Now, I don't want a single one of you in here to think about a pink elephant. Do not think about a pink elephant. I don't want you to think about its pink trunk. I do not want you to think about its pink ears. I don't want you to think about its huge pink size. Do not think about that pink tail. Do not think about a pink elephant. What's happened? We've all drawn a very vivid picture of a pink elephant in our minds, right? This is exactly what happens to the man who gets up every morning and says, do not look at porn. Do not look at porn today. Do not look at porn today. Guess what he's going to do? He's going to look at porn. And so we, we've got to shift the paradigm. We have to get a whole different vision for what does it mean to be a man of integrity? What does it mean to live this kind of life? So I want to share with you a passage from Ephesians chapter 5, because this helps cast, I think, the right kind of vision that we are to have in order to live a life of radical integrity. So I'm going to actually read, it's a little bit of a lengthy passage, I'm going to read chapter 5, verse 1 through 17, and then we're going to take a look at a few things in here that I think are critical for us to be men of integrity. Starting in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 5, therefore... 
Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now guys, we could spend an entire seminary semester just going over this portion of scripture, but I think it's really, really critical to look at this because I think this paints the right picture. This starts giving us the right vision of what it means to be a man of integrity. And if you boiled it all down, it's right there in the first verse. Be imitators of God. Now, some people would look at that and they would think of an, being an, imitating God means, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to puppeteer myself to look the way God looks. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be this great servant. And I'm going to make sure I do all the right works. And I'm going to obey His laws. But look at what it says right after that. As beloved children. We don't imitate God as mere servants. We don't imitate God as law keepers. We imitate God as His children. This is very significant because we are the children of God. That's a completely different dynamic of relationship when it comes to this idea of imitating. Think about it this way. You know, we all have fathers who had fathers who had fathers who had fathers all the way back to Adam. And if you think about that, there's a, there's a certain family line, right? Right? And you've, bear, you've carried a certain name. And I think a lot of times in our Western culture, this isn't as uh, prominently thought of, but the idea of bearing that name well, right? The idea of there's, there's, a, there's a reputation and there's a dignity to that name. You know, you got the family name. Well, I think this is a lot of what God is saying here. Be an imitator of me. Bear my name well. How are you as a child of mine imitating me. And one of the first things out of the gate when he's talking about being an imitator of God is he goes to this aspect of sexuality. Isn't that interesting? Remember we said yesterday we were made by God to be image bearers and yet we become image builders? What was the thing that God said when he made the creature that would bear his image? He said, let us make man in our image. So in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Part of the essence of what God has placed his image on is maleness and femaleness, our sexuality. Part of bearing God's image is the fact that we are male. And so it makes it doesn't surprise me at all that here when he's saying, be an imitator of God, now let's talk about your sexuality. It's a very it's a tight connection there because part of bearing the image of God is male and female. And what he says here is, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. See, we are instead to bear the name of who? God. We are to be an imitator of God. We are not 
to attach ourselves to the name of sexual morality and covetousness and all these things that are impure. That's image building, and we're making it about basically idolatry, worshiping ourselves, instead of bearing the name of God. And this is significant because I've, I've in my own personal journey, I, I've come to believe that the reason that the enemy attacks men so strongly in this area of sexual temptation and sexual sin is exactly why we're, what we're talking about here is because it's one of the fastest ways that the enemy can remove us away from what our real vision is, to be an imitator of God. If he can get us all tangled up in sexual morality and all these other things that are going to take us away from how God designed us to be male and bear his image, then guess what? We have lost, we've, we've gotten off track. We're in the wrong trajectory. And so he goes right here into the sexual morality piece. And there's something that I think is interesting because... God is not afraid to tell us what not to do, right? The problem is, is that we focus so strongly on all the prohibitions that we forget that he always contrasts them with what we are to do. And see, that's why this little video here, even though it's funny, really actually points out a very significant thing in that we, a lot of times we look in the scripture and we see the, the law of God. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit murder. You know, don't lie. We look at all the don'ts. And we forget that there are many, many positive commands that are contrasting these don'ts. And really the don'ts, if you think about it, God is not asking us to focus on the don'ts. He's just saying, I want you to know very clearly where the line is. And see, here's the thing I've discovered, guys. In the early part of my recovery, when I was really trying to figure out, okay, how, how do I live as a man of purity? How do I live free from the sexual temptation and the sin in my life? I was focused intently on where the line of failure was. Okay, because i got to be clear on where the line of failure is. And I see so many guys do this. They're focusing so intently on where the line of failure is. Guess what happens? Where do you go regarding your focus? You go where you're focusing on. So guess where they're camped out? The line of failure. Even if they're two inches from it, they're still right there. Here's the good news. If you want to be free, and I'm not talking about just like, okay, I don't go there anymore, but free in the sense that your desires are actually uh, transformed, then it's more about this idea of imitating God and being close to Jesus. Because here's the thing I've discovered. The more, I am, uh, the more I'm connected to Jesus, the closer I get to Jesus, guess what I'm not even thinking about? I'm not even thinking about where the line of failure is. Because I'm so far from it, and it's not even on my register. Why? Because I'm focused intently on imitating God by being close to Jesus. So here's the thing. He says, don't do these sexual morality. You know, the sexual immorality, that's something that's not even to be named among you. Don't attach yourself. Don't be an imitator of that. Be an imitator of God. But then he says, instead of all these things, instead of covetousness and, and filthiness and foolish talk and crude joking... He says, instead, let there be thanksgiving. And so that's the positive command here. So we look at it as, okay, I, I, yeah, I get it. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be sexually immoral. I shouldn't covet. I shouldn't all this. And then we, we keep focusing on where the line is in all those areas. Uh, let me focus on, on where the sexual immorality line is. And let me make sure I don't get close to that. Well, guess what? It's like, don't think about a pink elephant. I'm getting close to it the more I think about it. He says, no, all these things can re be replaced with your focus shifting onto thanksgiving. Now, this may seem like an odd shift, right? Because you're thinking, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't the shift be think about what's pure, uh, think about all the gifts that God's given to us so that we don't covet anything that anybody else has? Wouldn't you think that the, the opposite of that would be, you know, hey, speak edifying words that are true and all this? And it's not that any of that is not true, because there's other places in the scriptures that tell us about those things. But here, Paul is covering this with a blanket and saying, all of those things, you can shift away from all of those things and replace all of them with an attitude of thanksgiving, with a focus on being thankful. Now, this perplexed me for, for quite a while in the early years of my recovery journey, because I really did think it was all about... Hey, stop looking at porn and stop and line of failure and stop, 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 stop it. 
And then I started realizing that all of that kind of focus was not actually shifting my heart. It was shifting my behavior, but it was not shifting my heart. And this is the, this is the difference between guys being abstinent and guys being free. We have a lot of guys in our ministry that they've become pros at abstinence, meaning they're not crossing that line, but they are not free. They are not free. They are bound up in the anxiety of not crossing that line. And that's just it. When you, when you start to realize that at the depth of who we are, we are, we are made to be thankful people. Because if you think about it, think, even in this passage, when we look at what God has done for us, when he says here, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Guys, the only proper response to that is thanksgiving. I mean, that God did that for us, and we know how broken and sinful and frail and weak we are, and He did that for us. The proper response is thanksgiving. And here's the interesting thing. I can always tell when a guy is starting to to have the the real transformation shift, when when there's a real... um, I guess what I would call freedom that's coming into his life. And it's this barometer of thanksgiving. And I tell guys that. I say, okay, how, how are you doing on the thanksgiving front? You know, what are you thankful for? And, of course, then they spin in their minds. They go, i got to give the guy the right answer because, I mean, i got to be thankful for something. And so they, they oh, I'm thankful for my job, and I'm thankful for my wife. And, I'm, and it's like it takes them a while to, to then go, oh, yeah, but he probably wants to hear something about God. So, yeah, I'm thankful for Jesus, and I'm thankful for... And he's, like, coming up with the right answer, right? And that, that usually tells me, okay, we got a ways to go to get to the heart. Because here's the thing. When you've shifted to an attitude of thanksgiving, it starts to be a, a position of overflow. Not something that you're trying to think of. When, and that's part of getting close to Jesus. When you realize that He gave Himself up for me. He went to the cross for me. He paid a death that I deserved. He did that for me. Then what ends up happening is your heart becomes so full of that thanksgiving that it just begins to overflow. It's not something you have to think about. It's something that becomes part of who you are. So if you want kind of a good barometer of gauging, hey, where am I in this process? How am I doing in terms of shifting away from this idea of sexual morality and covetousness and all these other things, filthy talk, how, how am I doing? Am I just holding the line in terms of saying, okay, I just don't want to cross that line, and so behaviorally I may be okay, but my heart isn't shifting? Ask yourself about your, your thanksgiving. Now, if we are called to be imitators of God, what, is, what does that even mean? Well, because if you think about it, okay, God tells us in His Word there is no one like God. Well, how do we imitate somebody that nobody is like? How do you imitate God, you know? And, and the good news is that we're told in Hebrews chapter 13 that Jesus was the exact representation of the Father. You want to see what God looks like? Look at Jesus. And so now we have something flesh and blood, something we can hold on to, something we can see, something we can witness, something we can hear. And that's what it's going to take in order to imitate God. You imitate God by imitating Jesus. So what then does that look like? Because really, if you think about imitating, especially if we talk about the, the family line, right? When you talk about the family line, we're, we're really being asked to look like our dad. You know, if you're going to carry that name well, then how does dad act? How does dad respond to people? What, is, what are dad's values? What is, uh, you know, what does dad uh, really um, promote? What's the character? And so that's kind of what we're doing here. We're saying, okay, what is God like? Okay, what is Jesus like? Now, what does that look like? Because we're called to look like Jesus. So I think we could take a, ask the question, so what, how do we look like God? Well, there's an aspect certainly of holiness. God is holy. We're told throughout the Word in a lot of different places, but we are told in uh, 1 Peter 1 to be holy as I am holy. And that's actually going back to Leviticus. The, the, by God, when He gave the law, He's saying, 
I am holy, meaning I am set apart. Remember, no one is like God. He said, therefore, if, if you are going to be my people, you also need to be set apart. You also need to be holy. There's obviously an aspect of purity to this, but really it's more about that idea of saying you are set apart. You are to be different. And so to look like God, we need to be different. And not for the sake of being different. We need to be different simply by looking like Him. When we begin to adopt a serious attitude towards holiness, listen, it won't take too long before you'll already look different than the rest of the world. Okay? I mean... You don't have to try that hard to look different. Just, just try a little bit of holiness, and I promise you, you're going to look way different than the rest of the world because this world is immersed in darkness and sin and, and depravity. And so part of it, but also, this aspect of holiness, think about the beacon of light that this makes you in the world in which you live. See, because God is set apart, there's no one like Him. When Jesus came, he was constantly amazing the people around him. Not just with miracles, with what he was saying and how he was conducting himself and how he was living. And so, and this was because he was the exact representation of the Father. And in all of history, there'd never been this kind of man. And so therefore, the good news is that because Christ paid the penalty for us, He rose to new life, and then through faith, He gives us His very life, we too can have that kind of impact in our sphere of influence, in the world in which we live, if we begin to look like Him in holiness. Also, God is just. He's righteous. He's just. Now, this is, this is one where when we start looking like him in this respect, this will also set us apart. Because we live in a very um, relativistic culture. Truth is relative, right? Meaning, therefore, whatever's true to you must be true. I mean, that's, we, just, uh, <clears throat> we really make truth relative. But God is just. He does have very black and white lines between what is right and what is wrong. And did you know the Bible actually commands us to be angry? A lot of people go, wait a second, wait a second, are you kidding me? That can't be right. Yeah, no, the Bible actually says, be angry, yet do not sin. It's actually an imperative. It's not just saying, hey, by the way, if you happen to feel angry every now and then, just make sure you don't sin. No, it's actually saying, be angry. You know what that is? That's the justice piece of God. There are things that are right to be angry about. Guys, we should be angry about what pornography is doing to people's lives, and not just the consumers' lives, the people in pornography. We should be angry about the abuse and the exploitation that is happening. We should be angry about human trafficking. We should be angry about the things that are going on that are unjust in the world. And that's, that's part of reflecting the character of God. And so one of the things that has actually helped me Along the way, because I really thought, again, man, it's about that line of failure, right? Just make sure you don't cross that line. Don't cross that line. And then I started, God started showing me that there is a righteous anger. There's a just anger. And I started, I started actually having a, uh, I guess you could say, a response towards pornography that wasn't just fear or, oh, my goodness, I need to get away from that. It was, it made me mad. There was a righteous anger because there's exploitation going on on every level in pornography. And you know what? That's why we support organizations that are trying to actually dismantle aspects of the pornography industry. When, when we have opportunity in our, in our city to be part of, of uh, lovingly let, yet firmly shutting down certain establishments that are promoting these kinds of things, we get involved in that. Because there are things that are, it's right to be angry about them. And that's one way that we look like God. Another thing is full of His Spirit. We're told in Galatians, it's the same, uh, the same book. I'm, I'm sorry, we're told in Galatians, not Ephesians. We're told in Galatians about the fruit of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. The Spirit produces these things in our lives. 
And if it's the Spirit that produces these things, then the Spirit is part of the triune God. So therefore, what He's producing is like God. So therefore, we need to allow Him access and free reign to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I always like to... I love the fact that we're told that last little piece is a fruit of the Spirit, self-control. It almost seems uh, counterintuitive, right? Well, it says self-control. Well, isn't that me? I mean, aren't I, I'm self-controlled, right? No, 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 no. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Have, have, how, how have any of you guys, have you guys done a great job of controlling yourself? How many of us have done a great job of really controlling ourselves, controlling our, our lusts and our passions and our... Yeah, me neither, okay? So it had better be something that is, is supernatural. And God tells us in His Word, it is. Self-control is a supernatural work of the Spirit. And that's one way that we look like God. Because here's the interesting thing about God. How many of you, how many of you guys have ever thought, you don't have to raise your hand on this, but how many of you ever have have ever seen things going on in the world or seen things going on in your family and thought, man, if I were God, I would have done it this way. Or, or you look throughout history and you go, man, I, would have, I don't even know if people would have made it past, you know, Abraham. I would have just killed them all. That. And aren't we glad that we aren't God, right? God exhibits self-control because he has a perfect plan. He has a plan that he sees all the pieces and all the parts and he sees how it all comes together. And so he is the one that even displays to us his own self-control, that he withholds, he gives mercy, or he gives grace, and he withholds judgment. He, he is a God of self-control. And so if we want to look like him, we need to be full of his spirit. Also, he's true. He's true. We're going to look at this in, the, in a little more detail in the next uh, session when we talk about being men of honesty. But see, God tells the truth. In fact, he cannot lie. He cannot lie, which means he is, as Jesus said, he is the truth. Now think about that for a second. The reason I said earlier is that about how important it is to just continue to pursue getting close to Jesus, and then you won't even be aware or even worry about where the lines of failure are, is because Jesus said he himself is the truth. And guys, in order to be a man of integrity, we have to be truth tellers. And not just truth tellers, we have to be those who live the truth. And because the truth is a person, then in order for us to be truthful, we need to be engaged in that relationship with Jesus. Because you know what I've, I've noticed my natural proclivity? My natural proclivity in my flesh is always to go toward the dark is always to go toward deception. And so it had better be about me getting close to Jesus, the truth, if I want to be a man of truthfulness. Because I'm sure you guys have all experienced this at some point in your life. You're asked a question by somebody. It could be your wife. It could be a friend, whatever. You're asked a question. You know what the truth is, but it won't reflect well on you. That moment in your being when you have that strong, powerful tug to go the other direction and not tell the truth is exactly what I'm talking about here. We have that natural proclivity to say, I want to go over here and I want to self-protect and I want to make it, you know, remember, remember making it all about me. I don't, want to, I don't want to look that weak and that frail and that broken and that sinful, so I lie. Well, guess what? Every lie, no matter how quote-unquote small, is not looking like God. It's not being a man of integrity. And so I tell guys all the time, you got to tell the truth no matter how painful. And, and, that's be, and the good news is because Jesus Christ is the truth and because he said he gave himself up for you, that when you tell the truth, you were in line with him. And he has already said, I accept you fully. I love you fully. I've covered you in the blood of, in the, blood of the cross. So, therefore, when we tell the truth to others and whatever backlash may come on us from them, it is not something we would receive from the Lord. Because he says, every time you line up with truth, you are lining up with me. Because I am the truth.
Pure Sex Radio is paid for by Be Broken Ministries. Visit us online at puresexradio.com. 